Hi, it's Chris again, and welcome to another Nightfall Audiobooks production. This will be The Overnight by R.L. Stein. It's a Fear Street novel. It's book three. Pretty early in the Fear Street series. I have not read this before. This will be read to you from the, the page. It's the actual book. I got this from abebooks.com. They're not sponsored, by the way, but that's where I go to get all of my used books. And I'm using them to flesh out my R.L. Stein library for this show. I don't know anything about this. It looks like there is a fiction writers club at Shadyside High School. And these people end up, these students end up on Fear Island for an overnight. And things go awry. So we will see what's going to happen. I've leafed through it a little bit. I think I have the voices ironed out. Um, I don't know if I ever shared this or not, but I do have a tiny marble composition book. And I keep a list of the, the books I'm reading and the voices I've assigned to each character. Usually the main character is me. I don't know. 95% of the time it's a female. It's just how it's working out for some reason. So we're going to get into this and we'll see where it takes us. This is a short book. It's 146 pages, so 18 chapters it should be. And this will probably end up being a Thursday book. So let's get started. If you want to get in touch with me, you can write me an email, nightfallaudiobooks at gmail.com. I am on YouTube at Nightfall Audiobooks. Feel free to like, subscribe, leave me a comment. I love reading your comments. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell whoever you think would like to listen to me read to them R.L. Stein novels. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you at the end of the book. Welcome to a Nightfall Audiobooks production of The Overnight by R.L. Stein, a Fear Street novel, Book 3. Chapter 1 Della O'Connor tugs the combination lock, wondering why she could never get it to open on her first try. All the way down the long hall, locker doors slammed and kids laughed and shouted to each other, the daily celebration of school letting out. The lock pulled open on the third try. She removed it and swung open the locker door groaning as the heart on the inside of the door came into view. Last September, someone had scratched the heart and the words Della and Gary inside it into the gray paint. For the hundredth time, Della told herself to find something to cover it up. She didn't want to be reminded of Gary every time she opened her locker. She had angrily broken up with him three weeks ago, never dreaming that he would take her seriously, that they wouldn't make up in time for the spring prom. But the prom had come and gone, and Gary was just gone. He hadn't called her since their fight, and whenever she ran into him in the halls at school, he passed right by without giving her a chance to say anything. Della was looking forward to the outdoors club overnight. Gary would be there, and she would be able to apologize to him then. She pictured him smiling at her. Staring at the heart on the locker door, she pictured his wavy blonde hair, his lively brown eyes, the way they crinkled when he smiled at her, the tiny freckles on his cheeks. The overnight will be so romantic, she thought, camping out all night under the stars, just the two of us. Of course, the other members of the Outdoors Club will be there too, including Suki Thomas, who had obviously joined just to be close to Gary. But Della wasn't worried about Suki. She was confident she could get Gary back if she could talk with him. Well, fairly confident. She tossed her books to the floor of the locker and fixed her hair, peering into the small, square mirror she had attached to the locker door above the heart. With her pale skin, her bright green eyes, her long, straight black hair, Della was very pretty. She was thin with a model's figure. She always looked calm, cool, and together, even when she didn't feel that way. Slamming the locker shut, she was surprised to see her friend, Maya Franklin, standing beside her. Maya, how long have you been standing there? Not long. How do you get your hair to do that? Maya asked. Do what? Be straight? They both laughed. Maya had short, auburn hair the curliest hair anyone had ever seen, probably curly enough to make the Guinness Book of World Records. With her round eyeglasses and her short, boyish figure, she reminded Della of Orphan Annie. Are you going to the Outdoors Club meeting? Maya asked. Of course. Della jammed the combination lock shut. Hey, did your parents give you permission to go in the overnight? Yeah, finally. After calling Mr. Abner five times and making him reassure them, that it was going to be properly chaperoned and make him promise he'd keep his eye especially on me at all times. Maya's parents were so strict with her, they treated her like a ten-year-old, 
What's their problem, anyway? Della asked, shaking her head. I don't know. I guess they think if I spend the night camping out on an island where there are boys, I'm going to behave like a rabbit in heat. And what's wrong with that? Della asked. Both girls entered Mr. Abner's classroom, laughing. Three other members of the outdoors club were already there, sitting together in the front row. Gary was talking to Suki Thomas. He looked up for a split second, and when he saw that it was Della, he quickly turned his attention back to Suki. Suki seemed very pleased to have his attention. She was smiling at him and resting a hand on his arm. At first glance, Suki seemed an unlikely candidate for the outdoors club. She was very punky looking, with spiky platinum hair and four earrings in each ear. She was wearing a tight black sweater, with a long deliberate tear in one sleeve, and a very short black leather skirt over dark purple tights. The purple of the tights matched her lipstick perfectly. Look at Gary making goo-goo eyes at Suki, pretending he doesn't see me, Della told herself. What do boys see in her anyway? She didn't have to ask that question. Everyone in school knew the answer. Suki had quite a reputation. Pete Goodwin said hi and flashed Della a smile as she and Maya headed to join everyone in the front row. He's kind of good-looking, Della thought, sitting down next to him, even though he's so straight. Pete had short brown hair and serious brown eyes. He was very preppy-looking. Some of his friends even called him the prep, which he didn't seem to mind. Where's Abner? Della asked, lowering herself into the seat, resting her arms on the flip-down desk. She watched Suki patting Gary's arm. He was called to the office and said he'd be right back, Pete said. How's it going, Della? Fine, I guess. The windows were open. A soft spring breeze floated in. The sweet smell of fresh-cut grass blew into the room. Della could hear the thwack, thwack of tennis balls being hit from the tennis courts beyond the teacher's parking lot. Guess we'll be planning the overnight today, Pete said awkwardly. Guess so, Della replied just as awkwardly. Della cleared her throat loudly and scooted her chair forward, trying to get Gary's attention. But he refused to turn around, keeping his gaze firmly fixed on Suki, who was pulling at the threads of his sweater sleeve as she talked to him. Uh-oh. Look what just climbed out from behind his rock, Maya warned Della in a loud whisper. Everyone looked up as Ricky Shore bounced into the room. Ricky was wearing an oversized white t-shirt with big black letters across the front that read, Nothing to Say. This pretty much summed up Ricky's sense of humor, in the opinion of most of Shadyside High students. Ricky tried so hard to be funny all the time, and the fact that he tried so hard was the only funny thing about him. He was short and chubby. His clothes always seemed to be a size or two too big for him, and his black hair, which was never combed, fell down in tangles over his forehead. He was always pushing it back with a pudgy hand. Walking quickly, Ricky headed to the front of the room. Don't applaud, just throw money, he said, laughing an exaggeratedly loud laugh. The other five members of the outdoors club groaned in unison. It was a response Ricky was accustomed to. The smile didn't drop from his face. Okay, quiz time, he announced. Take out a sheet of paper and number from one to two thousand. No, only kidding, he added quickly. Here, take a look at this. He held up a sprig of leaves, which he dropped onto Gary's desk. What's this supposed to be? Gary asked, looking away from Suki for the first time. This is the outdoors club, right? Ricky asked, grinning. He pointed at the leaves on Gary's desk. Identify those. I bet you can't. Gary looked confused. He picked up the leaves. You want me to identify these? Yeah, you're the club president. Identify them. Gary held the leaves up close to his face and turned them over and over in his hands, studying them. Come on, Gary. You can do it, Pete urged. No, he can't, Ricky said, leaning over Gary's desk. Uh, it's from some kind of tree, right? Gary asked. Beech tree. Sassafras. Ricky shook his head, very pleased with himself. Gary hated to be wrong. He slapped the narrow leaves against his hand. Ah, who cares, he said grumpily. You should care, Ricky told him. It's poison ivy, he burst out laughing. Huh? Gary angrily jumped from the chair, the leaves still gripped tightly in his hand. Ricky tried to get away, but Gary was too fast for him. He wrestled Ricky down to the floor and started rubbing the leaves on Ricky's face and forehead. Ricky was laughing and screaming at the same time, struggling helplessly to get away. Della, Suki, Pete, and Maya were loudly cheering Gary on. What's going on here? A voice called loudly from the doorway. Everyone turned to see Mr. Abner stride into the room, his long legs bringing him quickly to the scene of the wrestling match. Gary, get off him. What are you doing? Gary, breathing heavily, backed away. Just getting ready for the overnight, he told the tall, lanky teacher. 
We're having a little poison ivy identification here. Ricky groaned, rolled over, and slowly struggled to his feet. His t-shirt had rolled up and a wide expanse of white belly protruded. Poison ivy? Mr. Abner looked confused. He reached out and took the leaves from Gary's hand. These are from a house plant. Grape ivy, he said, looking quizzically at Gary, then at Ricky. April Fool, Ricky told Gary, a wide grin spreading across his face. He shoved his hair back out of his eyes. Everyone laughed, mainly because of the shocked look on Gary's face. He got you, Suki told Gary, pulling him back to his seat. He got you that time. Gary forced a smile to his face, more for Suki's sake than for anyone else's. Take your seats. Afraid this is going to be a short meeting, Mr. Abner said, walking over to the window and looking out at the parking lot. Everyone became silent. What did he mean? He had a very serious look on his normally cheerful face. I have a personal emergency back home in Nashville, he told them, still looking out the window. I have to go home this weekend, so I won't be able to take you to the overnight Saturday. Suki and Ricky groaned out loud. No one else made a sound. Della looked at Gary, then down at the floor, disappointed. We'll have to postpone it, Mr. Abner said, turning around and sitting on a window ledge. But there'll still be time. It's only May. We'll reschedule it when I get back, okay? Everyone muttered agreement. I've got to run, Mr. Abner said, glancing up at the wall clock over his desk. Sorry about this. See you guys next week. He hurried out the door with even longer strides than usual. Della and her friends sat in silence until he was gone. What a shame, Della said, starting to get up. Saturday's supposed to be a beautiful day, too, Pete said. At least, that's what they said on the radio. They all started to get up. Hey, wait, I've got an idea, Suki said, motioning for the others to come back. Listen, really, I've got a great idea. Let's go on the overnight. What? Maya cried. Suki, what do you mean? Let's go on the overnight anyway, you know, without Abner. Go without an advisor? Maya seemed to be appalled by the idea. My parents would kill me. I'd be grounded for life, for two lifetimes. They'll never know, Suki said. Yeah, right, Ricky cried enthusiastically. Neat idea. We'll go by ourselves. It'll be terrific. No one to bother us or tell us what to do. He stared at Suki. Who wants to share my tent? Get real sure, Suki said, rolling her eyes. You won't get mosquitoes to share your tent. Everyone else laughed. Ricky looked really hurt. Our parents will think we're being chaperoned. They'll think Abner is with us, Suki said, lowering her voice, even though there is no one around to overhear. And what they don't know won't hurt them. She put a hand on Gary's arm. What do you think? You're the club president. Well, Gary started. But my parents will kill me, Maya protested. I think it's a great idea, Pete said, looking at Della. After all, we're very responsible. We're not going to do anything crazy, right? Suki grinned up at Gary. Not if we can help it, she said meaningfully. What do you think, Della? Pete asked. Della was eager to go. It could be fun, she said. We really don't need Abner. It could be a lot of fun, she thought, especially if I can pry Gary away from Suki long enough to make up with him. What do you say, Gary? Suki demanded. Well, okay, he grinned at her. Let's do it. Let's go Saturday morning, just as we planned. That brought a cheer, from everyone except Maya. I can't, she said unhappily. If my parents ever found out... They won't find out, Maya, Della said. Really, everything will be fine. We'll have a great time, even better than if we had a chaperone. We'll come home Sunday morning as scheduled, and none of her parents will ever know. You promise? Maya asked Della, her voice filled with doubt. I promise, Della told her. Trust me, Maya. Nothing bad will happen. Chapter 2 Did you pack a toothbrush? What about your toothbrush? Della silently counted to three. Then, in a controlled voice, she said, Yes, Mom, I packed my toothbrush. Do you think I should take my hair dryer, too? And another three or four changes of clothing? It is overnight, after all. No need to be sarcastic, Mrs. O'Connor said, squeezing Della's rolled-up sleeping bag. Is this rolled tightly enough? Will you be able to carry it, do you think? Della's mother was short and very thin. She weighed just under 100 pounds, and she always moved and talked quickly asking ten questions in a time it took most people to ask one. She reminded Della of a butterfly fluttering from flower to flower without ever resting. Now, Saturday morning, she was busily fluttering around Della's room as Della prepared for the overnight. Mom, what are you so uptight about? Della asked. We used to camp out a lot when Dad was still here. She felt a sudden pang of regret. 
Maybe she shouldn't have mentioned her father so casually. Her parents had divorced two years before, and her father had immediately remarried. Her mother didn't react. She was too busy squeezing the sleeping bag. This Mr. Abner, she said, you never talk much about him. That's because I don't have him for any classes. He's just her club advisor. He's great, really. You shouldn't worry, Mom. But why Fear Island? Miss O'Connor asked. It's such a creepy place. Well, that's the point, Della said, walking over to the mirror and pulling the hairbrush down through her long, straight hair, even though it didn't need it. It's supposed to be exciting, see? But Fear Island? There have been such awful stories. Her mother straightened some books on a shelf and then fluffed the pillow on Della's bed. Fear Island was a small, uninhabited island covered with pine trees in the center of the lake behind the Fear Street woods. Even though it was a perfect spot for picnics and camping, and only a few minutes' boat ride from across the lake, few people ventured there because of the dreadful stories about it. Some said that strange animal mutations, hideous, dangerous creatures that didn't exist anywhere else, roamed the woods. Others said the island was infected with poisonous snakes, and there were stories that the island had been used long ago as an Indian burial ground, and that ghosts walked the woods at night, seeking revenge for their fate. Della didn't really believe any of the stories. She was sure they were made up by campers to discourage others from crowding onto the island, but they certainly added an air of adventure to an overnight there. We didn't want to camp in a boring state park, Della told her mother. We wanted to be somewhere more exciting. Well, I hope it isn't too exciting, her mother said, walking up behind her and straightening the bottom of her sweatshirt. If anything bad happens, you'll call me right away, right? Della spun around laughing. Call you? On what? I'll tell you what. I'll send up a smoke signal, okay? You're not funny, Mrs. O'Connor said, but she was laughing too. The honking of a car horn from the driveway ended their conversation. That's Pete, Della told her mother. She lifted her backpack onto her shoulders and picked up the blue sleeping bag. Who's Pete? her mother asked suspiciously. She wasn't used to the fact that Gary wasn't always hanging around. A boy from the club. Della leaned over, kissed her mother on the cheek, and lumbered out of the door under the weight of the bulging backpack. She waved to Pete, who climbed out of the blue Subaru station wagon to help her with her stuff. He was wearing tan chinos and a plaid flannel pullover shirt. Hi, he said, pulling up the rear door. Nice day. The sun was high in a solid blue sky. Yeah, it's so peaceful out here. Peaceful? He looked confused. My mother is now here asking a million questions. He laughed. He has such perfect teeth, she thought. Too perfect. Then she scolded herself for being so hard on him. He was a nice guy, after all. It was nice of him to offer her a ride to the lake. He couldn't help it if his teeth were too straight, and his nose was too straight and perfect, and his hair was too smooth, and he dressed better than anyone else. He really seemed to like her. Maybe, she thought, as she climbed into the front seat beside him. She should try to like him, too. But their conversation as they headed to the lake was awkward. Pete was telling her about some camping trip he had gone on with his family, but she couldn't concentrate. His voice kept drifting in and out of her consciousness. She was thinking about Gary. She kept thinking about what she would say to him, how she would start to make up with him when they were alone together in the woods. Did you? Pete asked. Huh? She realized she hadn't heard a word he'd said for at least a mile. Did you and Gary break up? He stared straight ahead at the road. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, no, I don't know. Pete laughed uncomfortably. Should I choose one of the above? Sorry, Della said. The question had gotten her all flustered. Gary and I, I mean, we haven't really settled things. Oh, Pete didn't hide his disappointment. This overnight should be fun, he said, changing the subject. You're not scared about spending the night on Fear Island, are you? No, I don't think so. Stick with me. I'll protect you, he said in an exaggerated, deep he-man voice. Protect me from what? From Ricky's bad jokes? I think he's kind of funny, Pete admitted, turning down Fear Street and heading toward the woods in a gross, unfunny kind of way. The car bumped over the road, which ended at the edge of the Fear Street woods, fifty yards or so from the water. Everyone's here already, Della said. Pete honked the horn as the others came into view. She could see Gary and Ricky arguing about something. Maya was sitting by the water. Suki was standing next to Gary. Pete stopped the car and cut the engine. Della could see backpacks and sleeping bags piled up beside the two canoes Gary had brought. She waved to her friends and helped Pete carry their equipment from the back of the station wagon. The lake looks so pretty today, she said. The water was very still and very blue, reflecting the clear sky above. Two ducks squawked and bobbed their heads as they swam near the shore. Fear Island was a low mound of green on the horizon. 
Okay, we're all here. We can get going, Gary said, looking at Della. He was wearing a faded denim jacket over a red t-shirt. His blonde, wavy hair sparkled like gold in the sun. He looks terrific, she thought. She gave him a warm smile, and he smiled back. Gary, I want, she started, but Suki quickly stepped in front of her. I've never paddled a canoe. Will you show me how? She asked Gary in a kittenish voice. Sure, he told her. Just sit in the middle and watch. The person in the middle doesn't paddle. I'll take this canoe. You guys can all take that one, Ricky said. He jumped into the one on the left and stretched out on his back, taking up the whole canoe. Very funny, sure. Remind us to laugh later, Suki said. Della had the smile at Suki's outfit. It wasn't exactly outdoorsy. Her jeans had silver studs up the pants legs. She wore a long black t-shirt with a shorter white Guns N' Roses t-shirt on top of it. As usual, she had four different earrings in each ear. Hi, Della. I'm here. Maya hurried over to Della, smiling but looking worried just the same. Great, Della said. Did your parents give you a hard time? No, not really, Maya said. Only when they dropped me off here, they wouldn't leave. They wanted to talk to Mr. Abner first. Oh, no. What did you do? Sure made a few jokes, and they decided they'd rather go, Suki cracked. Give me a break, Ricky cried, still lying in the canoe. Hey, where's the gas pedal in this thing? They changed their minds, Maya told Della. But I just know they're going to find out what we're doing. She nervously squeezed her hands into tight fists at her sides. Don't be ridiculous, Della said. How will they ever find out? A few minutes later, they were paddling, three to a canoe, over the still blue lake, out to Fear Island. The water so clear today, you can see fish in there, Pete said, leaning over the side and peering down. The canoe started to tip. Oh, sorry about that. He straightened and continued to paddle. Going for a swim, Pete, Ricky called from the other boat. You didn't bring a rubber ducky inner tube. No one laughed. The two canoes cut through the water side by side. Pete and Della paddled one canoe with Maya sitting in the middle. Gary and Ricky paddled the other, with Suki practically sitting in Gary's lap. Is she going to leave him alone for one second? Della asked herself. She was determined to talk to Gary as soon as possible. She had rehearsed over and over what she wanted to say. She knew he would want to go back to her once she talked with him, once she apologized. Suki could just find someone else. That wouldn't be a problem for her. Patient. Be patient, Della repeated silently as she rode. But it was so hard to wait. Why was there so much waiting in life? Even when you were supposed to be having a good time, you spent most of it waiting. The slap of the paddles against the water was the only sound now. Della began to feel really warm despite the cold air. She moved her paddle smoothly, keeping in rhythm with Pete's paddle. The island grew larger as they glided closer. She could make out a rocky beach in front of a line of pine trees. A few more minutes. Whoa! She heard Ricky cry out and looked up to see him standing up in the other canoe. His eyes were wide and he was covering his mouth with his hand. The boat tipped from side to side. Sit down, Gary yelled to him. Seasick! Seasick! Ricky shouted, struggling to stay on his feet as the canoe bobbed violently beneath him. Don't be a dork. You're going to tip us over, Suki cried very alarmed. Ricky held his paddle up over his head with one hand and kept his other hand over his mouth. Seasick! Oh, seasick! Sit down and be seasick, Gary yelled again. Oh, good idea! Ricky plopped back down in his place. He grinned at Gary and Suki. He had been faking the whole thing. Not funny, sure, Gary said, shaking his head. You should change your name to that, Suki added, still looking shaken. Not funny, sure. Come on, Ricky said, resuming his paddling. You guys got a laugh out of it, didn't you? Didn't you? They didn't answer him. The canoes began to bob up and down as the current became stronger near the island's shore. Della was enjoying the ride, the feel of the paddle in her hands pulling the canoe forward with each stroke, the cool wind against her face, the splash and tumble of the rolling water. A few minutes later, they were pulling the canoes onto the beach. I want to keep on going, she said, to no one in particular. It felt so good on the water. It feels much better to be on dry land, Suki said. Hey, she let go of the canoe to examine her hand. She had broken one of her long purple press-on nails. Now what am I going to do? I didn't pack any replacements, she grumbled. I guess that's what we call roughing it, Ricky cracked. She stuck her tongue out at him. Suki walked alongside the others, examining her broken nail as they pulled the canoes across a narrow strip of pebbles to where the trees began. They should be okay here, Gary said, dropping the front of his canoe at the foot of a tall pine tree. Is it lunchtime yet? Ricky asked. Can we order a pizza or something? Good idea. Why don't you go get it, Suki said, 
throwing the broken nail onto the sand. We'll wait here for you. Ricky looked hurt. I love campfires and making hot dogs over a fire, Maya said, looking a lot more cheerful. Hey, it's the morning, remember? Gary reminded them. We've got a lot to do before it's campfire time. Come on, pick up your packs and stuff. We've got to find a good campsite. Aye, aye, chief, Ricky said, giving Gary a backward salute. Pete helped Della with her backpack and handed her sleeping bag up to her. She thanked him and hurried up to walk with Maya. Pete was being really sweet, too sweet. She really didn't want to encourage him. They walked along the beach for a while, keeping near the tree line. The sun was higher in the sky now, and it was becoming really warm. Della looked up to see what was causing the loud, discordant squawking she heard. Two blue jays in a low tree limb seemed to be having an argument. Look how big they are, she said to Maya, pointing. Blue jays are the noisiest birds, Maya said disapprovingly. They're not at all like bluebirds. Bluebirds are so sweet. Welcome to Nature Studies 101, Ricky interrupted. Come on, Ricky, Della scolded. Why'd you come on this trip if you don't like to look at nature? To get close to you, babes, Ricky said, flashing her an evil grin. You know, I brought a king-size sleeping bag, big enough for me and a friend. What an irresistible invitation. Della made a face and started walking faster. A dirt path led into the trees, and they followed it. It curved through thick woods, still deep with brown winter leaves. After a while, they came to a circular clearing of tall grass and weeds. This looks good, Gary said, tossing the tent he'd been carrying over his shoulder to the ground. Let's set up here. They all gratefully removed their packs and placed them on the ground. There were two tents to be set up, one for the boys and one for the girls. No, turn them around this way, Pete instructed after they had started to stretch the canvas over the poles they had put together. The wind usually comes down from the north, so the backs of the tents should face north. Very impressive, Pete, Gary said, only half choking. He looked up at the sun, which was directly above them. But how do we tell which way is north? It's that way, Pete said, pointing. I have a compass on my watch. He held up his wrist, displaying one of those calculator watches with a dozen different functions. Do you think Daniel Boone had one of those? Ricky asked. Once again, everyone ignored him. They worked to turn the tents around and get them tightly pegged to the ground. Then they set off in different directions to gather enough firewood to last the night. Pete started to follow Della, but again she hurried to catch up with Maya. This is kind of scary, Maya said, stepping carefully over a deep puddle. But fun, Della added. She was very excited, she realized, but she wasn't sure why. Maybe it was the fact that they really were on their own, with no adults in sight. Anything could happen. Anything. Just the six of them, alone in the woods for a night. It could be so romantic. She headed away from Maya and started in the direction Gary had gone off in. This is my chance to talk to him, she thought. She realized that her heart was pounding. Her mouth felt dry. She didn't think she'd be this nervous. Gary must mean more to me than I let myself admit, she thought. She stepped quickly over the dry brown leaves and fallen twigs, looking for him through the birch and pine trees. It smelled so sweet and fresh in the woods. She couldn't wait to talk to him, to be with him again, to feel his arms around her. How could she have been so stupid as to lose her temper like that and break up with him? She didn't even remember now what the argument was about. A squirrel stopped halfway down a tree trunk. It stared at her as she hurried past, then scampered over the leaves to the next tree. Gary, I want to apologize. Those were going to be her first words. No fancy introductions, no excuses or explanations. She just apologized and get it over with. She stopped. There he was. She could see him through a gap in the trees. She stifled a horrified gasp. He was leaning back against a broad tree trunk. Suki was pressed against him. They had their arms wrapped tightly around each other. Their eyes were closed. They were locked together in a long, long kiss.